Hello and welcome again to another episode of Alegria in Kansas City. I'm your host Fabian Shepard and you know that on this program we like to educate, inspire, and inform. Today we hope to inform you about a great Kansas Cityan. My dear friend Elliot Threat has lived in Kansas City his entire life and he is a variable history of Kansas City. <laughs> he is a fantastic guy, he's a funny guy, and I am happy to have him with us today. Welcome, Thank Elliot. Thank you, Fabian. I love that introduction. I love that introduction. Thank you, sir. It's an honor to be here. Well, it's an honor to have you. It's a pleasure. We've known each other for more than 30 years. I know, for a long time, back when we were doing stand-up comedy together. Yes, and, and we had a lot of fun. And we were both, we were both very entrepreneurial back then and it's yes. funny how it kind of uh, it kind of catches on later in life you know yeah we both ended up starting our own businesses yes, exactly. you still have your own yeah. businesses and and i'm working but, for yeah, the man the man <laughs> <laughs> You're still your own businessman. Well, I, I like to think so in many ways, <laughs> Elliot. Um, so let's talk about, I started off by telling the folks at home uh -huh. about you being here your entire life. Yeah. Your family history is a pretty neat history in Kansas City. Well, it, is, it is a pretty neat history, actually. My father was one of the uh, first African-American city officials, along with Alvin Brooks, who we both know, and uh, kind of had a, a, a fingerprint on a lot of areas in town, including this area. Uh, and uh, it's great growing up around all those people, all those legends like uh, Alvin Brooks and Ollie Gates and Satchel Paige and all these other folks who we came in contact with. And it just uh, makes me love Kansas City that much more. So when you talk about Ollie Gates, I, I, I happen to know a little bit about Ollie Gates. Yes. Your father's relationship with him, your friendship, yeah. it still doesn't get you any free fries. No, no, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't get you anything. It's amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> And Ollie Gates has a Super Bowl party every year, at least uh, prior to COVID, actually. And you go, okay, Gates Super Bowl party. They were a very VIP group. Let's get in here. Let's get some Gates. And they never sold barbecue. It was never, it was never like, what? What? It barbecue's down the street. You got to pay for it. But, I love uh, it. Ollie Gates, one of the, he's an entrepreneurial legend in Kansas City as well, too. Yeah, so we were talking, you and I, um, I, I had a guest on, and we were talking about the fountain. Your dad helped with the that The Spirit fountain. of Freedom Fountain. Yes. Yeah, it's on, uh, it's on Swole Parkway Boulevard, and it's a fountain by an artist named Richard Hunt, and you kind of see it there. And a lot of the other fountains, uh, they were more, they're older. This was a more recent fountain, and I remember the artist, his name was Richard Hunt, and... We actually got a lot of, I like to think that our, we kind of helped pick out the fountain. I'm sure it was already done. But the relevant part for me was is that after the fountain was picked up, I got to go to Chicago with my dad, see Second City, and kind of, uh, kind of have my imprint in comedy and see a, a professional African-American sculpt. I mean, I, I still haven't met another black sculptor to this day or, or Hispanic sculptors. It's not something you see in your everyday life, so I just really uh, cherished hanging around with him. Well, that's fantastic. Now, speaking of sculptors, we have a mutual friend that I've known for about 30 years, and you've met recently a sculptor, <laughs> a famous sculptor here from Kansas City. Stretch. 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 <laughs> Grinders. Yeah, famous, yes, but he is a sculptor. He is amazing. It's amazing how you, your life touched a lot of people who have uh, gone on. If there's a, six degrees of Fabian Shepard, actually, <laughs> is everybody. You can talk to everybody, and there's six. You are the Kevin Bacon of Kansas City. But yeah, <laughs> Stretch is a sculptor. So that's, the, that's the second sculptor I've met in my lifetime. You don't meet a lot of them. You know? Well, yeah, and, and I thought it was great that you called me up and said, hey, I just did this TV show with Stretch. Yeah. And, you were the topic of conversation. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> well, we talked about how we're uh, coping with COVID, was that, I think, on the, this week in Kansas City. So. Sure, sure. Um, so back to your family, though. Yes. And, and your father, he was the first black city manager for he was Kansas a, City. Well, right? First, a lot of things. He was uh, one of the first black graduates of the Wharton School. Oh, at wow. The University of Pennsylvania. And... Uh, a lot, a lot of those things there. But, you know, I mean, luckily the other folks have followed in his path and everything like that. I get to see his footprints. And, and actually, luckily, a lot of his friends are still around. I'm blessed. Even though I'm pushing up on uh, 60 years old here, a lot of them are still around. I still get to hang out with them. Well, and, you know, I bet your father, your father was not a man of 
many words. Your father is a pretty laid back guy. Yeah, he was. Um, he I was... like to think I'm like that. I'm laid back. I'm hard to. <laughs> I'm hard to. I'm hard to uh, you know get. Uh, we'll let excited. you think that yeah. since you like it. <laughs> um, but also. Your family dynamic was pretty neat. I mean, you you grew up in a place where it, you know, the color of your skin, it, it never was a limit. There were no barriers because of it for you. It was never a limit, although when we, you know, in Alvin Brooks's book, uh, actually, uh, when we first came into town, uh, Mr. Brooks drove my family to a, a hotel and uh, they said, well, the city, you know, city officials coming and they found out he was black and they they turned us away. I mean, it's in this book, and uh, it's amazing. We had to call the. Uh, it's amazing that the person who was in town at that time to direct housing was being discriminated against. But uh, it happens, and uh, we move on from there. Right, right. Um, and, and well, in fact, the neighborhood where where your parents lived, uh, yeah. that was not a neighborhood where people. I mean, well, you that's were, a, you that, were that, the funny story state about that. line yeah, and yeah. Meyer, yeah, basically funny story right about across that. from Mission and, Hills. And when we went to buy that house, they found out a person of color wanted it, and of course it was sold. This is, you know what I mean? And uh, my father had to have his lawyer, a white lawyer, very nice guy, Jim Bowers, who still goes around. He had to act like he was buying the house, and then once they said, okay, we'll sell it, then we, we kind of flipped him around. But... Uh, you know, those are the boundaries we, we break, and uh, you know, we're nice, sweet people, and that's the way it is. There's integrated neighbors all around Kansas City, and that's the best thing about KC. Well, oh, fantastic, fantastic, Elliot. Well, I know that the first time I was driving uh, beneath Bartle Hall, H.O. Bartle you Hall, there downtown, sign. and I saw the sign. James I3 Boulevard. Yeah, I, yeah. I saw your dad's name up there. You know, I, I was proud Hill, to yeah. see that. Quality Hill is one of his developments, along with the Vista Hotel and, and Swole, all that Swole Parkway stuff, uh, the health center and all that other stuff. That was all his early developments done in a thing called the Model Cities Program. So it's nice to see those things grow up and, and genderfy and become very successful. I love it. I, I absolutely love it. And, and I can tell you that your dad was a special person. Oh, I know. It's great to see. A lot to live up to, you know what I mean? But... Uh, Great thing about my dad was that he let me become a comedian, you know, because back then college degrees still are the gold standards for a lot of people and their kids. And my sisters and brothers went that way, but I wanted to be a comedy, and uh, it worked out fine. Well, and you've done really well with stand-up comedy. Well, like that way, it, it, yeah, as you know, being a comedian helps you in every other thing because having a, a quick wit and a personality and a sense of humor helps you in every facet. The ability to speak. Unless you're maybe a mortician. Probably then it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't, doesn't go too good. But anything you don't else, have to be as yeah, malleable yeah, yeah, in that yeah, regard. Yeah, a surgeon or something like that. But anything else, anything we do, no comedy surgeons helps. cracking yeah, jokes really. while they've got someone coming <laughs> You can't get away from it, can no, you? You no. can't stop it. <laughs> can't stop it. <laughs> um, so I want to talk a little bit about that before we go to break here. Mm -hmm. um, your your family dynamic, your history here in Kansas City, it's not just confined to comedy, though, because you're also a businessman. You're an entrepreneur. You mentioned that earlier. Yes. You've had various businesses. A lot of businesses. You still have businesses a in Kansas City. A lot of businesses. City. And you know, that's, uh, that's, that's a great thing. It's a very entrepreneurial city, this is. And uh, I've had a lot of it. I've had vitamin stores. I've had pizza restaurants. I've had, I've had uh, the, the shops, the concessions at the airport, sub shops, everything. So business was always the extension because as a comedian, I said, uh, as a life lesson, I'd, I didn't mind not being famous. I just wanted to work for myself. And at the end of the day, if you work for yourself, you know, you, it gets addicted and you got to keep on doing it. So I just found this was an insurance policy and you kind of make your own direction. And I'm just as happy with that as I am in stand up. In fact, a little bit happier because stand up, as you know, we had to travel a long way. Oh. For not, and I did it, a lot, I did no a lot money, of your gigs a long yeah, way. Yeah, yes, yeah, I, yeah. You know, I. You and I both, we rode in cars with people like Drew Carey yeah. and, you know, some of the most famous Jimmy people Walker. on television yeah. now, Jimmy Walker. Uh, yeah, um, we rode to a lot of your gigs, actually. We were kind of, <laughs> any place in Iowa, it's a place I haven't heard of, you were booking a gig there. I did book quite That's a right. few gigs. I've never been to Lamar's, fun. Iowa. I had a gig there. I've never been to Atlantic, Iowa. But, I had a gig, but yeah. wasn't it great when the money started finally coming, doing it did. those big shows and concert halls? And you should have been a, camp a campaign operative in Iowa because you knew every town. <laughs> 
You could have done leg work for anybody there. He was on the, you're on the ground before campaigns ever started in Iowa. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. We're going to go to break right now. We'll come back. Okay. Folks, we will be right back with my good friend, Elliot Threat. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome back to Alegria in Kansas City. I'm your host, Fabian Shepard, and we're going to continue with my, my good friend here, Elliot Threat. Elliot, now, before we went to break, we talked about your businesses. Yeah. And I, I want to talk about more than just the, the profit in there. As you talked about, working for yourself is important to you. Very important. And a very wise person once told me that, you know, just do what you love and the money will come. That's true. But most importantly, the satisfaction comes. Exactly. And I, I have to think you're right now and every day doing what you love. I pinch myself often. I'm, I'm just surprised that all the, uh, all the things that you cobble together ends up in a certain place. You know, there's so many little butterflies effects in everybody's life and that takes place that gets to where you are. And it's just, it worked out well for me. Well, fantastic. Now, I want to talk about what you've done with the businesses, because recently you were featured on a local station and you gave away like 200 pizzas, didn't you? Yeah. Well, you know, every year on my birthday uh, for the last, ever, since I've been doing well, and I went out as everybody goes and they spend a lot of money on their birthday and they, they don't leave very satisfied. They have very expensive leftovers in the refrigerator the next day. And I said, let's, uh, let's share it with the community. Let's take whatever money we're going to spend at that fancy place and go out and, and serve the community and tie it back to the city that's given us so much. So uh, we've gone to every, we've gone to uh, Thelma's Kitchen, we've gone to Hope Faith Shelter, we've gone to Community Assistance Council. and. For the first few years, I did my age in years, but the need was a little bit bigger with COVID. So I just, you know, in school they tell you, if you can't bring enough for everybody, don't bring it. So uh, a lot more than uh, 59 people yeah, <laughs> yeah. that whole faith. So they said it was 200, so we went with 200. That's great, 200 pizzas. Yeah. And, and these were people who really have a need. Yeah, well, the, 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 what I enjoy the most about it is that my whole family comes down and we get along and it's great, uh, my daughter, my son, my wife, to, to just kind of do that you know, for a couple hours long after the camera's gone. And, and we still volunteer at all those places and it's fun, actually. The only, uh, what I miss is the connection uh, that I would get when I would volunteer at places like Thelma's because all those folks, although you might drive down on the highway, they have a special dignity about them and they have a story to tell and it's great to listen. And a lot of those people uh, suffer with loneliness. So sometimes I'd go down and volunteer and they say, well, we've got all the volunteers. And they said, all right, I'll see you later. I said, no, can you just sit down and talk with some of these folks? And some, that's very therapeutic too. That's great, Elliot. I'm, I'm so glad that you continue to do that too for the community. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fantastic thing. Um, now, yes. I, beyond that, you talked about your family. Mm -hmm. um, your family, you're not the only celebrity in the family. You've oh, got, no. Everybody. You've got some... Yeah, sports stars and and yeah. things like that. That's that that's that's true. Actually, do you uh, care to mention some of those famous well, family my, uh, members? Well, my well, uh, my nephew plays on the USC football team right now. They almost got this close to a Rose Bowl, and then there's of course uh, uh, my niece Anthony uh, Anthony Peeler's daughter Addison, who uh, is doing great in volleyball down in uh, oh God, what's this uh, Tulane down in New Orleans, and. Uh, that's about so Anthony Peeler, a yeah, former exactly. Los Angeles yeah. Laker. And right. more Missouri grad. Missouri Tiger. Purcell graduate. Yeah. Those are the most important things. Okay. Yeah, okay, thing. whatever. Yes, yes. Yeah, for, yes. the, for the Kansas uh, resident well, here. My family, <laughs> yeah. The, the sports DNA comes from other parts. Of the, 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 we marry into that. We're, we're the comedy <laughs> DNA. We're the personality DNA. So, so we're, we're going to move away from some yeah. of those athletes. Because yeah. you got other athletes, yeah. uh, professional athletes in the family, too. But we want to talk about the big thing, how you and I met. Oh my God! You know, on the stage doing stand-up comedy, and what? it seems like a hundred years ago. It does, but it also seems like yesterday. Well, you were just—you had so much uh, self-confidence; it was just shocking. You were just a little—you know—you're just 
a petite little thing and <laughs> you just had this huge voice and it just was kind of oh my gosh and then you know all these old comedians would come in and who's running it it's like well this 14 year old <laughs> is running the comedy this why is the 14 year old drinking a beer we don't know but he's running it and uh, it's, it's his it show. was crazy yeah and and the way you had as a uh, as a Panamanian, to go to these places in rural, rural Kansas, and these people just adopted you as their, yeah. I mean, it was amazing, you know, the attachment, because we were like, oh my God, how's this going to go? <laughs> kind of like did, the, We did work some rooms yeah, where we, we like felt the, like we needed yeah, the chicken wire. The Blues Brothers scene, yeah. <laughs> and they'd come in and give you a big hug. It's like, what? You know what I mean? And it's like, baby, baby. You know? but, but, you know, the, the cool thing is, like you said, you never really cared about being famous. And mm -hmm. I didn't go into it to be famous. It was fun, fun to just do... To make people laugh for a living. Well, it's, it's fun to make people laugh and, and see the whole country there. You yeah, know what I mean? and travel and you the got world. To see, you got to see the world and you and got to see people. Cruise ships yeah. and, and, and resorts and things like that. But you, I, I mean, well, I think one of the coolest things, and I always tell people this about you, because, you know, I, I met the guy at, at Stanford's Comedy Club, and, and mm -hmm. he's a nice enough guy, mm -hmm. very quiet. But you and Dennis Miller were yeah. roommates in yeah. Los Angeles. Oh, yeah. Dennis and a, a lot of other people there, actually. And uh, Sinbad, we all, we're all in that group. And, and the only difference there is that uh, Dennis and Sinbad were, uh, were about 10 years older than me. So they were a lot motivated. When I lived in L.A., I was 21. So you have different motivations at 21 when, than you do when you're 30. As you know, everything changes. Right, so right. You think everything will come to you, and they were more professional driven. But you know what? At the end of the day, uh, I'm, I'm happy with my choice because uh, the fun thing about celebrity is you know that uh, when you're celebrity, your money runs out long before your fame does. Yeah. And yeah, it we gets see a bit that, awkward. That some of those folks, Todd yeah, Bridges we'll and Leif yeah, Garrett. And yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> you don't want to be that guy. <laughs> exa exactly, because you have to do something else, but that fame hangs over you and you're subjected to all the scrutiny. So now, especially in this day and age, I think I'd much rather be doing well than having the fame because that seems to have too many sides to it. Then. Right, right. And you are doing well. And you were one of those guys that always insulated yourself from the bad boy stuff. You weren't that. But, but you were married and had a family when the yeah. rest of us were bachelors. Yeah, exactly, you know? exactly. And you, you caught up with me there. But uh, <laughs> but that was just the, the st stability. You know, I had already been, because I when I came back to Kansas City, and met all you guys, I had already been in comedy since I was 18, so I'd already been in it like 10 years. So I'd, I'd had all my, my wild days and everything like that behind me, so I was kind of, I was kind of throttling down when everybody else was throttling up. Yeah, we were throttling up, all right, there was a lot. Of, I remember the first time I worked with Tim Jones out in L.A., oh, and I, I, I called you up, I said, you know this guy? Yeah, I know that yeah. guy, he's only in every commercial yes. on TV. <laughs> he was a great guy, too, Tim Jones, and we just lost Paul Mooney just yeah, the other day. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I, you know, it seems amazing to me how they just, uh, these guys that we kind of grew up with in comedy are falling by the wayside. Well, it, it, it is kind of interesting, and, and that's the quandary there, because when we're comedians, you always have to, you always have to talk at comedy where you are. So the act we did when we were in our 20s, we could not do it in our 50s. No, no. Because people don't accept it. So you have to adjust your act to apply to everybody, at the same time be individual to yourself, right? Right, so, right. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure that Eddie Murphy could do the sets that he did no. now. Uh, not well, in this when day I and watch age. my my tapes over the years, it's like, okay, here's my single set. Here's my set about changing diapers. Here's my set about teenage. You know what I mean? It just kind of right, follows right. you along in your life there. You know? Yeah, yeah. And and I do think that it does. It manifests itself into into your act uh, as your life changes. As as you. As you mature, in fact, uh, I remember some of the jokes you used to do. Oh, I could, that, I could never do those jokes. Those, yeah, yeah, and and that's that's the thing. But that's the great thing about comedy. Well, Catherine wouldn't let you do yeah, some exactly. of the jokes. Now you got to deal exactly. with her. And then you know there gets to be an awkward point where your kids some see your act, and then everything comes into focus. Then because it's like okay. If you can do your act in front of your kids, your adult kids, then I think uh, you're comfortable with yourself. You know? Right, right. Well, one of the things I thought was neat was 
Like, I would get booked to do a show with some famous artist. Yeah. And you'd worked with them years before. Yeah. Like, I did Leon Russell. Yeah. That concert was pretty cool. And, and you're like, yeah, I know Leon. Yeah, I worked exactly. with him. <laughs> you know, that's an amazing thing. And when you work with folks who, uh, when you work with them when they're not famous, when you're starting up, that they remember you because those are the ones you remember. As you get famous, as folks get famous and more fluent, they meet a lot of people and it just whips by real quick. But, you know, you spend the week with Roseanne and, uh, and, <laughs> and Amarillo. Yeah, know, and, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I spend remember. Spend a week with Jeff Foxworthy. I, I, I spent a Thanksgiving with Drew Carey one yeah. time, the bone in, uh, in Des Moines. And <laughs> they'll remember it forever. Yeah. They'll remember it forever. Steve Harvey, we've all hung out with him. Yeah, you know Steve I mean? Harvey down in Arlington. And um, there are a lot of, a lot of really neat stories from the road. Most of them we can't tell on this show, but there are a lot of neat stories we have from them. A lot, a lot of neat stories. And, and, and by the way, I, I was just thinking of this. Um, you mentioned Sinbad a couple of times. Sinbad was a Star Search grand champion winner. Yes. And, and you've, you have yeah, a great friendship with him, but also Mike Sacconi from yeah, right here in Kansas Mike City. Mike Sacconi, hundred thousand dollar grand Star Search prize winner, winner. Actually, yes. yeah. Funny thing is that uh, Sinbad went up against Dennis Miller at Star Search, and I was in the audience, and they were both friends of mine, and uh, <laughs> they tied, right? They wow. tied. So Dennis Miller and Sinbad tied, and then it went to the audience. And it's like, well, then Sinbad won. Everybody loves him, you know what I mean? So yeah, that yeah. Of, or they, but they, that's when Star Search meant a lot. But Mike Sacconi comes back to Kansas City, and that's kind of. It's kind of the, the, the old wise tale that people kind of go out and they kind of end up where they started. They kind of close the loop and come back. Yeah. And well, you and I, right here in Kansas City, Eddie Griffin, I remember yes. his first night on stage. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I remember You remember that. this, and he's an older comedian. Now. Yeah, 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 yeah. These are guys that... Have been, but I remember his first night on stage, and, and I mean, that was something. Well, you know, the, the, he, he was very, he was very raw, like yes. Eddie Murphy, but you know what? He's a testament because he's, the people at Stanford didn't really want him, and he says, well, I've got my own dream, and I'll go out to L.A., and then, you know, we look up, and, and he's opening bam, up for Dice Clay, it. and he's in movies and everything like that. So don't ever let anybody tell you what you can't do. Right? And, and that's, that's probably the takeaway I take from our lives in stand-up. What, what, what would be the one thing you would share with the audience? I, I mean, that was a nice one there. Don't, don't let anybody tell you what you can't do. But, I mean, your experience in business, in, in your philanthropy, in, in comedy, you know, you're pretty diverse My experience there. is... Uh, you know, be kind to everybody. I'm always kind. You know, when a phone solicitor calls up, I see people yell. It's like I say, thank you for my time. Because they all have a job, you know what I mean? And just be kind to everybody. It's, it's much easier. And uh, I don't ever, uh, I, I just try to treat everybody the way I like to be treated. And that's, that's, that's not my saying. That's just common, right? But if you're kind to everybody from, from people in a homeless shelter to, to phone solicitors to anybody you run into, I think you'll, you'll be much happier at the end of the day. I love that. I love that. Be kind to everybody. That's right. That's the key. Exactly. Um, because, you know, we, we really don't have people being yes. kind to but everybody. You are, we you are kind to everybody, and it helps, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it does. It, yeah. it helps a lot to be, you know, I, I just don't feel the need to not do that. I mean, well, you know what's most rewarding about that is that lots of times people uh, come up to me or you or anybody who's kind and they'll say, "Hey, you don't remember me, but you did X, Y, and Z for me, and it meant a lot." And it's like, really? I don't, you know what I mean? You can't even tell because it's just the way you are. And right. That's the right. most rewarding thing of all. You know, and from our time in comedy, that's one of the things I, I remember a lot of people. I remember a lot of names, but what I remember most is how people treated the me. nicer comedians. Yes. Yes. The rude comedians, you know, I mean, they just hated those, but the nice folks were very decent to you, and that's the way I always treat. And that's the way I always treated, you know, open micers or any other comedians. You always treat comedians decent, and uh, or anybody from the wait staff to everybody else. Right. It just helps, you know. And there are a lot and, of prima donnas in yeah, a lot of and a lot of people I met that you know were in comedy or, or didn't do comedy or that are very successful in comedy say, Ellie, you did this and this for me, and it's like, oh, really? I, I didn't really remember that, and it's like, oh, yeah, you did. It, it meant this and it led to that, and I don't know about that. But on uh, that note, I want to ask you, what's it like for you? You're 59 now. Looking, yes. Looking at some of those guys, you know, that were up and comers that you you watch their careers start and then watch them flourish yeah I, james johan comes yeah. to mind you yeah know, very nice guy. i live in lenexa and, mm -hmm. and you know and he 
he's got property there in Lenox also. Mm -hmm. um, you, I remember when he began. You know, and and he was very young, yeah. and he looked young. So you was know. Chris Porter. They were all very young. Yeah. And so, what's that like? But for you, you were to look young, back? and we were young. I mean, when I think about these young guys, I think I was so old. But at the time, I was maybe twenty-six. We were, yeah, 27. we were yeah. actually young at yeah. the time, and, and, and they were just, they were just very young. Well, it, it's great to see those guys uh, build their careers and lives from um, from that point. You know, especially when they they go into other things and everything like that. But the fact that, that you can have a good in comedy, if you can have a good quarter, which means 25 years in it, you know, you did very well there. And I, I'm a little upset that other comics don't get the chance to have the road time, the, the 80s and everything like that, because the comedians starting out now have a much harder time than we did. They we, do. we just had our name on a piece of paper that said the comedy store and the improv, and we could work the whole country and get, get paid a decent wage and everything like that. But it's much harder now to do it. Yes, it is. It's a lot harder now. And I, I do feel for some of these guys that have an incredible wealth of talent but have a hard time getting gigs. Yeah. But the, hey, we used to travel we used to travel four hours, five hours just to showcase. That was just part well, of the Well, that's yeah. true. Yeah. That's true. But it was worth it. It was worth it. It was it. worth it. Worth it at the um, end of the day. So the, then the before we go out of this, and, and thank you so much for no doing problem. this. You're welcome My to come honor. back anytime. I appreciate um, it. The last thing I want to talk to you about is yeah. I got this email out of the blue. Yes. And, and, and I called you up. I said, what do you know about this? It was so neat to hear from Chip Chinnery. Oh, who, my God. He's like the king of commercials. Yes, you know? Chip. And he's writing this book. And he did the most amazing thing that I wish I had done. He took pictures of every person he worked with. This is long before he saw he Polaroids. Every, and he gave me one, and he gave everybody his one. And so he has this history of comedy from Chappelle to Kathleen Maddox. Everybody we mentioned, he has that Chappelle. And he was doing a story. We talk about the butterfly effects and helping. Brian Burgess right. helped him out. And Brian wasn't even aware of this. And he calls back to try to get a hold of uh, Burgess and calls you to just try to find out what's been going on with these guys. Right, right. Because they were very kind to him. And of course, Back to what I said, if you're kind to people all the time, it helps out people and you don't even know it and you have this great little legacy behind you that you didn't even see. Well, this is fun. You know, I reconnected with Gene McGuire on Facebook and, and some of those really cool people. Um, and I know that uh, I saw some pictures of you with John Penny and some well, of those. Well, it's amazing. Yeah. And we remember everybody. Kaius it's like our high school, right? Yeah. It's, it's like a lot it's of our fun. high school. Yeah. Well, Folks, this was a nice trip down memory lane for me with my good buddy, Elliot Three. Man, this was, I, I am so grateful for Thank you doing you, this. Yeah. And uh, I, I hope some of those names we mentioned get to see this. I and, hope so too. And hear all the kind things you said about them. Uh -huh. Well, I want to thank you for joining us for another Alegria in Kansas City. And remember, Alegria in Kansas City is brought to you by Televida, a production of Exo Films. I'm Fabian Shepard, and we'll see you next time.